Hello everyone, welcome to Dr. Johnson's Library, where we talk about humanities, literature, and nerdy shit. I'm Dr. Johnson, and this is my library. In today's video, uh, which is kind of the first of what I'm trying out here, we're talking a little bit about politics, a little bit about the world, I guess, as it is today. Um, and I come from a place, or I come from the idea that pop culture can teach us a lot. Uh, comic books especially, but far beyond that. Um, that's, that's kind of what I do for a living, and that's what I've decided to kind of share here and now. So today, we are discussing the idea that Sergeant Rock can, teaches us that gender is performative. Uh, gender is a performance. That's the idea here. And I want to talk about this because if you look at the news or the, the world in general, oy, um, you will see a lot of people talking about this idea of, oh, trans rights, transgender folk, gender, it, changing genders or identifying as a certain gender, and people on one side saying, well, you can't do that. That's not acceptable. Uh, a woman is a woman, a man is a man. These are hard and fast definitions. And when you get to sex, which is about physical, biological stuff, ish, um, there are distinctly male, distinctly female, but if you look at history, and pretty much any culture has stories and adaptations thereof, there are people who don't fit into those molds. There are people who are hermaphroditic in one way or another, that, you know, genes do genetic things. So there's a lot more going on at the level of sex, even if you want to argue that it's more binary. But gender, the stuff that makes a man a man, other than testicles and a, maybe a penis, well, testicles are the only thing you have to have, I suppose, um... The, what makes a man manly or masculine, that's a whole performance. People get this idea that it's hard and fast, that it's demonstrative, that it's, the word, a good word for it is ontological. Man is man. This is manly, and everything else is in definition around it because it has its own innate definition in the same way that, say, grass is green and water makes you wet. Um, and again... I would argue that this is not the case, and I will proceed to demonstrate why in this video. So if you disagree with me, hang around, let me make my case and see if you still disagree. Um, yeah, that's the way that polite interaction and discussion works. Hooray! Um, so I'm going to focus in this video on masculinity uh, for a couple of reasons. First off, well, I do comics, and if you've ever read a comic, you know it's mostly about guys. It's the, the idea in the minds of the marketers and the creators was that it was for adolescent males, you know, young boys. That is not necessarily the case, but that is often what people perceive. The other reason, and if I keep looking over here, it's because I got notes. Um, the other thing I want, I, the other reason to focus on male is that it's, in many circles, man or masculine or male is the ontological definition. And, or is the ontological piece. And then woman is that which is not male. Um, so male has its innate definition. You just know what manliness is, according to these folks. And then feminine or female or whatever is defined in opposition to that. Um, so that is my preposition or my supposition is that that is not the case. Now this builds on uh, a lot of scholarship and a lot of kind of perspectives in the academic world. But the big name for this is Judith Butler, who wrote a book called Gender Trouble in 1990. And she was focusing on femininity and the ways that that can be displayed and the ways that it is basically a play, an act, a performance. Um, now, again, my focus is on masculinity, but it's the same idea. And when I say gender is performative, that doesn't mean it's necessarily fake, although we'll get to that. It means that gender is what you do not who you are. It's, it's a, a thing and it's an act. It's something that you have to learn and you have to display. Um, so, Sergeant Rock. Uh, also, yeah, so I'll get this a little closer. Sergeant Rock uh, is a comic from DC. He was, never had his own title per se, but he was the main feature of Our Army at War um, through the 60s, 70s, most of the 80s. He's less around today, but he was the the forerunner, and not the forerunner, the uh, the poster boy 
the main character for DC's war comics throughout the post-war years, the Viet mostly the Vietnam, uh, and then in the 70s and 80s. So Sergeant Rock was the big guy. He came, he was pretty introduced in 1959 in a war anthology series called G.I. Combat, which was later renamed Our Army at War. And even though it was never his comic or his title, Sergeant Rock appeared in almost every issue, especially in the later years. Uh, he appeared on almost every cover. And um, great character, a lot of fun. Uh, the Rock of Easy Company, he's the, the sergeant's sergeant. Hell, there's even a song called Sergeant Rock is Going to Help Me. Make the girl mine, keep her stood in line. Um, not a great song, but it's fun. Um, he was introduced, or he was created by Robert Kaniger and Joe Kubert. Uh, Robert Kaniger especially got fame for, he was closely associated with Sergeant Rock. Sergeant Rock is also, I should note, because uh, I'm doing a paper on it or trying to, <clears throat> he's where we get Nick Fury. So if you're a fan of uh, Colonel Fury, he started as Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, um, and then in 1963, by 1969, he, 67 or 69, somewhere in there, uh, he was Colonel Fury, leader of S.H.I.E.L.D., which also ran concurrently with his Sergeant Fury World War II adventures. So same guy, but like 30 years later. Uh, and that became the Nick Fury we know and love, who is, frankly, let's all admit, much better as Sam Jackson. Like, white Nick Fury was cool, but Sam Jackson's so much cooler. Um, anyway. <coughs> so... How does Sergeant Rock show us that gender is a performance? Well, Sergeant Rock is all about heroism, um, all about martial valor, military, you know, it's a war comic. It's, again, guys shooting at tanks and being manly and grr, determination, grr. Um, so in these comics, there's several main characters that kind of stay around. But then almost, you know, every other comic or so, or very regularly, they'll get a replacement. Somebody comes in from Repel Depel, uh, the requisition depot, or replacement depot. Um, and it's a green private, no idea what they're doing. And the guy says, I'm going to freeze. I'm going to dishonor Easy Company. Send me back. Don't let me get another, a better man killed. And he just, you know, is a green newbie and is going to, is freaking out the whole time. And Rock keeps telling him, no, you'll, you'll do what it, what it takes when the time comes. You'll you'll make it count. Um, and inevitably, because that's, you know, that's the formula for this comic, uh, when the chips are down, everybody in Easy Company, because things are never easy and easy, uh, they get taken down or they're pinned down, they can't do it, and the new guy picks up a grenade or a bazooka or just a bayonet, and he charges the enemy. And often he dies in the attempt. But he, you know, proves that he's a man in the last moment. He proves that he's a real hero. Now, these comics are, uh, again, about heroism, but I think we can, most of us would agree that when you talk about masculinity, it is closely linked with this idea of military valor and martial heroism. It's kind of the ideal. The manliest man is the warrior. Um, is And that's not always the case, and that may not be the case for any, you know, your mileage may vary. But that's kind of the idea in pop culture. Um, the hero is everything. So with that in mind, the premise here in almost all of these comics is that heroism is performative. Now you can make the argument that, it, oh, it's, it's innate. It's something that come, shines through in the final moment. But it's not. Uh, Rock himself, in several comics, breaks down. He, he gets shell shock, as they would have called it. Or combat fatigue. I think shell shock was World War One, but he he just kind of snaps, and he all in several of them, all he can do is just carry a wounded guy. He can't even lift a, a gun or pull a trigger, and he manages to stumble through and basically lives because of the borrowed courage of the other guy, and well, because he's the main character in plot armor. But it's this idea that like even the hero. Even a guy who's been a hero for 10 years, or as long as this war has been going on, not 10 years, obviously. But even a guy who's a hero to his core can break in the moment. He can have just too much. Something can change. Um, and there's a particular one that draws my interest. It's uh, let's see. Our Army at War, number 129. 
Heroes need cowards. Let me see if I can... And the premise, uh, it starts with Rock and Easy Company walking back to the rear lines and hearing a couple of rear echelon, you know, low-level officers calling each other a coward. And Rock says, no, nah, real combat men don't do that. Now, disclaimer, never been in combat, never been in the military, um, because I'm big and fat and lazy. Uh, so I don't know how accurate this is. Uh, Robert Kaniger was in the military in World War II. So was Cooper, I believe. Um, but yeah, I, I can't claim the veracity of this, but it's an interesting premise. You don't call a man a coward because you don't know what will happen. And they get two new guys, uh, a guy who would trained all his life as like, uh, his main job was to go into, I forget, something with water. He was like a swimmer. He was a lifeguard, something like that. And a guy who was, a uh, like a high wire, uh, electrician on like, Towers or Girder Man. He he worked on like high rise buildings, putting in girders and rivets and stuff. And as they're crossing a river, the high rise guy starts freaking out, going, "I'm gonna drown! I can't swim! God save me! I'm help, 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 help!" And the other guy, who's a practice swimmer, you know, "Hey man, this is nothing." Grabs him, carries him across, and the coward starts firing at an incoming enemy because that's all he can do. He can't save himself. All he can do is you know hold his gun and shoot. And the swimmer starts to get, ah, you're a coward, you're a wuss, you're a weenie. What's wrong with you? I'm ashamed to walk with you. And then they get up on top of a mountain, and the swimmer, naturally, starts freaking out. And he's, oh, God, I'm going to fall. Some, You know, ah. And the high-rise guy just grabs him. Hey, man, this is nothing. I've been on shakier, I've been on narrower ledges than this for, like, a lark. This is, this is nothing. And he saves the day. And, of course, the cowardly guy is he's dangling off the edge. He shoots down an enemy dive bomber because it's a war comic. <clears throat> but the premise is, or the idea here, is that it's what you do in the moment. Heroism, which again is kind of the ideal or the idealized form of masculinity, can come and go. In some situations, you're a coward. In some situations, you're a hero. All you can do is keep going and rely on the other guys around you in this situation to be heroes as well. They'll pick up the slack when you go down. You pick up the slack when they do. Um, but again, that core idea that it's not a, a coward or a hero is not what you are. It's what you do. It is a performance. Gender, masculinity, heroism is performative. Um, and there's another idea attached to this. Masculinity changes over time. And we can tell that it's a performance because the ideas of what are masculine evolve and alter over the course of history. And again, you can see this with pop culture. Uh, a favorite example of mine, Superman. Hold on, let me grab a illustrative example. That's a better one. Superman, when he started, uh, 1938, golden age, he was written by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schubert, and they were a couple depression kids who had lived through the Great Depression and really were not fans of the government or the businesses or the corrupt politician, pretty much anybody. Early Superman, Golden Age Superman, was a super reformer. He did not give a fuck. Superman, in his first comic, grabs a politician who's making under-the-cover deals, or under-the-table deals, and starts, like, carrying them along an electric wire, going, gee, hope we don't fall and die or get electrocuted. Boy, that'd be rough, wouldn't it? And basically terrorizes the man into confessing. <clears throat> um, he, at one point, just scares a bunch of hoodlums into jumping out a window and killing themselves, because golden age, they, they didn't kill people, but they certainly let people die. He goes, he forces uh, some mine owners to work in their own mind and then traps them in it to let them experience what it's like for the mine workers. He lets them out, but, you know, not until they've agreed that they're, they've been monsters. Early Superman was a super reformer. Oh, last one. He single-handedly leveled an entire tenement, like blocks and blocks of a city, just didn't tell anybody, just went in, smashed them all down, and then rebuilt them by hand into nice apartments and then terrorize the crap out of the slumlord who owned him. 
Superman, in his earliest iteration, was a super reformer. He embodied the, the need for action, the need for change, the deep-seated anger of the people of the Great Depression who lived through that. By the 1950s, post-World War II, Superman was the avatar of the status quo. He worked for the Daily Planet. He was a stand-up, responsible citizen with a good job. He, you know, had a female companion, but she knew her place. You know, even if she was spunky, she still kind of knew her place. Um, and there would be some external threat, like Lex Luthor or Brainiac, that would threaten normalcy. And Superman would punch him in the face and return the good, normal status quo. You know, this is the way America works. He was a super patrician, super status quo. Um, hell, most of the Silver Age comics are, he plays with the affections of Lois and like, haha, silly woman, trying to figure out my idea. She's such a, that darn uterus gets in the way of her thinking, haha, you know, it, it's rough, it's a rough read. But it's this idea of a man is not a reformer. A man is someone who supports society and makes sure that everybody knows their place within it. And you can see, you know, Superman doesn't beat people down because that's not what he's about, but you can see where that attitude is in there. That idea of women knowing their place. Um, and Because that's what, you know, Lois's dream is to be a homemaker and have super kids. It's messed up, but that's what it was. Then you get to the Bronze Age, uh, the 70s, 80s. Superman, you know, new... Uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths happened, rewrite the whole thing. Superman is kind of an immigrant. He's made good, but he's also very much about moral character. Um, it's not so much that he's patrician, he's just the good guy, the super immigrant. Garth Ennis, for as much as he hates superheroes, talks about this in the Dark Age of Superman as the ideal American immigrant in Hitman. And then you get uh, kind of the modern age and Super Jesus where he's all about, like, sacrificing and very, you know, Jesus iconography. Or you get the one I grew up with, Super Dad, uh, Superman the Animated Series, where his go-to move is to cross his arms and float sternly at, in front of people until they give up. Like, that's, that's not exactly the uh, same guy as the bust-down-the-tenements-slap-around-the-mind-bosses reformer. Or the keep people in their place, and, you know, because Superman in the animated series is much more equitable. The idea here, my point being, even the same character changes over time. He represents different iterations of masculinity. You can see this even more assert aggressively, I should say, when you look at other characters, like Wolverine. <clears throat> Compare Superman, you know, super reformer, super patrician, super whatever you want to say, Versus Wolverine or the Punisher. Kill them all and let God sort them out. You know, a man is somebody who fights and who is brutal and who takes vengeance. Uh, right in time with the 1980s and the 70s and, uh, what was it? Oh, damn, the Char... Not Charlton Heston. Um, Death Wish, that's it. Charlie Bronson. Um, all those movies about the, the regular guy killing the crap out of people and the rise of the action hero. So Wolverine is all about violence. He doesn't have any emotions. The only emotions he has is anger. Grr, snicked. But you also get Superman, who is, by definition, manly. I should have said that earlier. All of Superman's iterations are manly because, if nothing else, they are all contrasted with Clark Kent. Um, Robert Brown, I believe it is, this comic scholar, argues that there's something called the wimp-warrior dichotomy. And this is true in pretty much all superheroes. You have the alter right ego, the wimp, the one who gets pushed around. Lois calls him a wuss, says he can't stand up for himself. And then you've got the warrior, the badass, Superman, the real man, the reality of the character versus the wimp they pretend to be. So anything Superman does is inherently masculine because he's got Clark Kent to be countered to. And note that the lack of masculinity, in this case, is performative. So it's the wimp is someone he pretends to be. You see that with Bruce Wayne, or that kind of, you know, the rich playboy, uh, man about town, Kent, Kent Drake, Kent Allard, yeah. 
the shadow is who I'm thinking of. Um, but that kind of archetype of, oh, he pretends to be a playboy and he only cares about women and being a wimp and, you know, oh, I don't do anything. And then he turns into a badass in the moment. So again, even though it's talking about non-masculine gender identity, it is still performing that identity. And then as far as masculinity and Superman, I would argue that the latest of it, uh, my adventures with Superman kind of removes that wimp warrior dichotomy and it's just Clark all the time. And it's great. You should watch it. It's fantastic. But um, Superman is super patrician. Wolverine is violent and murderous. Uh, the Thing. You get this idea that, oh, men can't be emotional. Men are only violent. Well, The Thing or The Hulk, they're weepy all the damn time. They're tragic. They're the tragic hero turned into a monster. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it is still masculine. You know, you're never going to call the thing unmanly. He'll beat the shit out of you. Um, actually, he wouldn't because he's a nice guy, but he'll threaten to because he's, you know, one of the Yancey Street boys. The thing is a manly man. The thing is awesome. I hope they really make a really good Fantastic Four movie because um, the last two we had didn't. Um, but you get this tragic hero who is all about emotion or the Byronic hero who is dark and brooding and has deep feelings because of tragedy. Batman. It's Batman. Anytime you see a dark brooding hero who wants to be Batman, it's the Byronic hero. And again, Byronic hero comes from romanticism, the romantic period of literature. It's all about emotion. So we have the non-emotional Wolverine, who even then has, you know, struggles with anger and the beast and her. But he, his, his emotions are all anger. You have the tragic figure of the Hulk and the Thing. You have the Byronic hero who's all about angst and brooding. Um, who else did I write? Oh, yeah. And then there you have, for example, the Kennedy Man. Grant Morrison gives this appellation to characters like Reed Richards, Hank Pym, uh, Barry Allen. You know, the, the scientist from the 1960s. It was all about science and being charming and smokes up pipe. Because he's, you know, the, the scientific adventurer, if you think of, uh, or Doc Savage is kind of that type. If you ever watch the Venture Brothers, Doc Venture, the dad, that kind of like manly man who's buff and action oriented and gets all the ladies, but is definitely a man of science, definitely a thinker, you know, thinker, brains and muscles, um, or even like Reed Richards or Tony Stark, just brains, doesn't really do his own, well, he does his own fighting, but it's not because he's muscular, he builds a suit. So these are all different iterations of manliness. Um, the, the non-thinking berserker, the tragic hero, the Byronic hero, the thinking Kennedy man, all of these are different iterations of what it means to be manly. And none of them is less masculine than the other. Uh, maybe Reed Richards, because he's kind of a wuss. But, you know, the idea, the character type, they're all equally valid. Um, you might have personal disagreements. You might say, like, I prefer, like, if you're like me, I, I love Wolverine because I grew up with Wolverine. But part of me loves Beast, Hank McCoy, because, you know, he's violent, but also a thinker. Um, you might have your personal preferences, but they are all equally masculine. They are all equally valid iterations of manliness, which suggests, or at least to me it indicates, that it's about what you do. None of them is less manly. It's about how they perform it in different ways. You can be a manly man by being weepy. You can be a manly man by being emotional if you do it in the manly way, the prescribed heroic format, and ideally if you punch someone also. Um, but there are entire comics of the thing, like this man, this monster, where he doesn't throw a punch. It's all about his emotions, because Marvel considered itself a soap opera in many ways. <clears throat> and this points to a more general idea that I think most of us will relate to in one way or another, or at least be familiar with when it comes to performing masculinity from our own lives. This idea that boys don't cry. Um, you know, I grew up in the, the late 80s, early 90s. Um, I didn't hear it all every day, but that was definitely an attitude that I heard. Uh, it was somewhat petering out. I'm not sure how prevalent it is in the modern day. Hopefully it's going away. But this points to the idea of gender performance. Boys don't cry. Well, 
if you know if you've heard that you were probably being told that while you were crying or had just finished crying or were about to and if boys don't cry why were you crying it's an idea it's a performance the idea that oh to be a man means to perform lack of emotion being a man means to not cry even though everybody cries and again that is something that changes based on time, based on culture, based on ideology. Um, for instance, Sergeant Rock, to go back to our prime example, Sergeant Rock almost never cries, but he does on several specific occasions. Uh, for instance, they find a random dog that they named Sad Eyes in one comic, and Sad Eyes gets killed by an enemy uh, bomber strafing them as it's trying to protect Rock. And he goes all stoic and manly, but when they find the, the plane as it's trying to take off and Rock pulls out his Tommy gun and just blazes it apart, and finally at the last moment, you know, single solitary tear, I got him for you, sad eyes. Um, and it's, you know, it's the idea that you'll hear in pop culture of the man tear. They did the same thing in an episode of The Brave and the Bold, uh, Batman the Brave and the Bold, the cartoon series. They have an intro, and in one of them they introduce Sergeant Rock, and, you know, G.I. Robot, another character from this period that was much weirder, saves everybody on Omaha Beach with a self-sacrifice, and Rock looks on, sheds a single man tear, and then goes back to the fight. So we live in an age now where boys do cry. They just don't cry much because, you know, you have to repress the emotion because expressing healthy emotion is somehow unmasculine. I don't know. Um, and then you get other examples. And again, Rock was written in the, the 60s and 70s and 80s. So dealing with that older normative masculinity and that older idea. But even then, even in, living in the time when people were actively taught, or at least more so than, to, than today, boys don't cry, they were arguing that, yeah, yeah, they do. Real men cry sometimes. Real men feel emotion. So it is not, it is about performing it. And because Rock performs masculinity so well, he's allowed to cry. Um, another example, much more modern, Deku from My Hero Academia. Deku is just about the weepiest son of a bitch he ever did see. Um, I, I think Red from Overly Sarcastic Productions referred to him as the hero of the soft boy shonen, where it's a typical shonen at protagonist, except he's a total soft boy. Deku cries at the drop of a hat, but we really don't think anything less of him. Because he performs masculinity. He punches people. He does Detroit smash. You know, how can you be unmanly when you're punching people Team Rocket style into the stratosphere? So, <clears throat> you get that idea. And last example on this whole boys don't cry thing. Um, Zhuge Liang. A little closer for you. You may not know who this is. He's a character from the Three Kingdoms period of Chinese history. If you've played Dynasty Warriors, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, you know him. If you see any anime, where I'll do it again, uh, a character comes up holding a white feather fan in green and white robes with this kind of weird curling hat that like swoops back. They're in strategist robes, and they are meant to represent Zhuge Liang, chief strategist of the kingdom of uh, Shu in the Three Kingdoms period, known as Sleeping Dragon, known as Kong Ming, and known as Mr. It Will Burn. Um, the man was a pyromaniac. And according to the Three Kingdoms period, the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which is a historical fiction novel from the Ming Dynasty, at one point, he is fighting the Southern Man tribes, and they have special armor made of rattan, uh, bamboo-type material, that deflects arrows real well, and is even waterproof and like lets them float across rivers. And Zhuge Liang realizes, well, if it's good against f water, it's weak to fire. Also, he likes lighting things on fire. So he sets a trap in a narrow valley, blocks off one end. When the army marches in, he blocks off the other and then just fills it with fire and explosions and incendiary death. And as he stands watching the conflagration, watching the Holocaust, you know, death by flame, Holocaust, not capital H, but you know what I mean. Um, as he stands watching all this horror, he breaks down in tears. 
and he just weeps openly at the horror and the bloodshed, which is, if nothing else, human. It's a very human moment from this towering figure. Um, you don't quite get the same thing, but a very similar thing if you listen to uh, Sabaton's The Art of War about Sun Tzu, or Sun Tzu, the proper pronunciation. I stand alone and gaze upon the battlefield. Wasteland is all that's left after the fight, and now I'm searching a new way to defeat my enemy. No more will I see suffering and pain. I think I got the lyrics right. But that's the first verse. He doesn't, this is a man in the grips of emotion, struggling with the horror of war and bloodshed and yearning for a better way. Uh, it's a man looking at what he's done in the name of victory and breaking down. And in classical China, they didn't have this idea that boys don't cry. They, they argued that, you know, any person can feel all of the spectrum of human emotions. Women just aren't people. That's their, their opinion, not mine. That is not an endorsement. I'm just saying what they viewed. Um, but that was the attitude. You know, Liu Bei, the king of Shu, the kind of main hero, is, like Deku, a weepy son of a bitch. He loves to cry. But it's this, the point being, to bring it back to what I was trying to say in the first place, if you look at other cultures, if you look at the way that these attitudes evolve over time, most of us who are male in the United States have, at one point or another, been given instructions on how to perform masculinity. Whether or not we're, we want to admit that, we have been told this is the role you should play. This is how you should perform it. Which means there's no there there. There is nothing inherently male. There is nothing inherently female. There is nothing inherently gendered. Um, gender is what you choose to make of it. And I think that's a cool thing. I think that's amazing. Because um, that means we're not trapped. We can do whatever the hell we want. Um, my favorite example, and I wish I could come up with a more specific one, but if you watch anime, you know the trope. Big, manly man, you know, foot taller than everybody else, twice as more broad, just solid muscles all the way down, sitting in his room quilting, or gardening, or doing crochet, or cooking. <clears throat> and somebody looks at him like, isn't that kind of girly? I'm the manliest man in the continent. Anything I do is therefore, by definition, manly. I am manly. I do it in a manly way. Therefore, this quilt is the manliest quilt you've ever had. And it's soft and fluffy. Enjoy they're manly already. They don't need to be challenged. They don't. They're secure in it. And they, yeah, if you're a manly man, whatever you do is by definition manly. Um, how far you want to take that is up to you. I'll leave that up to you. But I, I think it's really cool that we have a say in what society does. That we have the power, if not necessarily on the individual level to control it, then we can at least help shift things. We can make pushes. We can arrive at a world where men are allowed to have emotions, where a hero like Deku can cry at the drop of a hat and still be pretty badass. Even if, they, even if you also have a hero like Bakugo who never cries, except for, you know, tears of rage and, you know, man tears. But that's allowed, even. Um, and the last thing I want to say, give you some examples of this idea of the positivity the idea that we can change it, that we can control it, and that's a good thing. And I'm kind of going to present two examples. Um, and both of these are not from comics, sadly, but from larger pop culture. Spike and Tyke from Tom and Jerry. Uh, you may not know their names, but you know who they are if you've seen Tom and Jerry. And if you haven't, why haven't you seen Tom and Jerry? Like, watch some old reruns. It's good. Uh, Spike is the bulldog, the one that beats the crap out of the cat, Tom, and occasionally protects Jerry. And that's Spike. And he's got the New York accent. See, in the tough Bronx of Brooklyn, I don't really know, but he's, he's a tough guy. See, listen here, cat. You're going to do what I say. Quit messing around. Um, 
And then later on in the late 50s, he gets Tyke, his baby, the little, the little tiny pup. And the thing about Spike is he is masculine. He is a manly man, right? He's big, he's tough, he's got the New York accent. Sometimes he's got the bowler hat. You know, if he's got a, if, if smoking occurs, he's got a cigar, which is the manly version before cigarettes, because uh, cigarettes were for women. Hey, look, it changes again. Um, but Spike is all about masculinity. He beats the crap out of Tom every chance he gets. And he loves his son. He adores his son. He spends every waking moment teaching his son how to be a, a bulldog, how to be a dog, how to, how to do it right. And he, yeah, that's my boy. And the minute Tom presents a problem, it's usually a threat to Tyke. And Spike beats the crap out of him. You know, listen here, cat. I'm, a, I'm training my boy how to chase cats. So he starts bucking, you start running. That kind of thing. And this might not seem exceptional to you, especially if, like me, you were raised decades later this by a generation that grew up with these stories. But my dad grew up with these stories. His dad grew up World War II, greatest generation. Well, he fought in World War II, so Depression era. Was not much of a father. Didn't really say I love you. Didn't spend time with his kids. His job was to go out and earn money and, you know, keep them fed. That's how he showed affection. My father, on the other hand, was very affectionate, very supportive, always, you know, encouraged me, excuse me, spent time with me, things like that. And in part, that's because he grew up with this cartoon model. This idea that not only is it acceptable to be fatherly, to love your children, and to want to spend time with them, it's manly. Spike is the manliest character in any Tom and Jerry cartoon. Even if they have a human male around, Spike is tougher. Spike's the big tough guy. And he loves his son. Manliness is connected with being a good dad. So you see where that's that changes culture. That changes society. Now we have like The Mandalorian or any number of moot shows or Last of Us where half of the half of the story is old man protects found child. You know, Lone Wolf and Cub from the 70s, which, again, read it if you haven't. It's amazing. But the whole premise is badass loves his son in a badass way and teaches his son to be a badass. It's great. Um, and another example of, not with children, but with relationships, Gomez Adams, my personal hero. Especially if you, it's true in any iteration, but especially if you watch the John Aston uh, 1960s TV show, the black and white one, Gomez is the epitome of a wife guy. And he's a family man too. He loves his kids, but he's really, really a wife guy. He is devoted to Morticia. He, his world revolves around her. And Gomez is... He's a less uh, less tough guy vision of masculinity, but he's still, he's a patrician masculinity. He's the father knows best type. He's the head of the household. He's a businessman. He's successful. He's kind of the wealthy patrician masculine who owns his house and runs his family. And he's all about them. He, his days are just filled with joy by spending time with his wife and his kids, and most especially his wife. Although he does, again, like in one episode, they send this kids to school and he starts moping around because he's got no one to play with. Because um, he's a big kid himself, which I love. But Gomez Adams is, again, consider it early 1960s, late 1950s. Think of Mad Men. You know, the, the masculine man, the home, the breadwinner, goes off to work, does a job where he drinks a lot and sits in an office and drinks three martini lunches. Comes home, wife fix him a, fixes him a martini and a pot roast. Maybe they have sex if he wants to. And then she just shuts up and spends all her time sewing or whatever. Gomez reimagines that. He reworks that idea and makes it all about, no, no, a manly man, a real breadwinner, a real homeowner, you know, the masculine ideal, adores his wife. 
He loves spending time with her. He loves his family. He would do anything he could to spend less time at work and more time with them. So it's, again, back to the point, all of these are reimagining and reinterpreting what it means to be masculine, what it means to be a man, what it means to be manly. And again, that demonstrates that it's a performance. It's about what you do, not what you are. But more importantly, at least to me, that shows we can change it. We, can, we have say over what our society is, over what our culture values. If we don't think some aspect of manliness or womanliness or femininity or whatever is valuable, it is within our power to alter it. Or if you think, you know, not trying to jump into too far into politics, if you think things have gone too far, it's still within our power to redefine it, to bring back some of the old ways, maybe. I'm not saying we should, but that is a thing that can be done. So me having it be in flux, having it be up to us, gives us a lot of freedom. It does take away some stability. I'll admit that. I can see where people would want these things to be, you know, I, I define so much of reality on male and feminine, bina masculine and feminine binaries, uh, like, you know, the structuralists, that you can't have one without the other, and it, having neither just means we're running, we're running without a map. We don't know what we're doing. It's all made up. And that can be scary. But it's also incredibly free. So... Anyway, to my mind, I like the idea of having a say in it better than I like Tim Allen telling me I gotta grunt and be stupid. So yeah, that's my two cents. Uh, thank you for sticking around. I hope you found the video interesting. I'm open to constructive feedback or constructive comment, criticism about uh, this new video type and whether or not it works. But yeah, thanks for everything. Take care.